polycystic ovary syndrome, or commonly referred to as PCOS. What you need to understand is that PCOS is a very broad category or subject and is the uh, subject of many textbooks. And so we're going to try to hit the highlights in this 5 to 10 minute video. In terms of the history of PCOS, it was first noted by two physicians back in 1935, Dr. Stein and Dr. Leventhal, that they noticed women with ovarian cysts and anovulation or lack of ovulating or having a normal menstrual period. Thus, it got its name as the Stein-Leventhal um, syndrome. It has since been changed to the polycystic ovary syndrome that we know so uh, commonly now. In regard to the etiology or what causes PCOS, um, quite frankly, is unknown at this time. However, there are a few um, ideas as to why PCOS comes about. First idea is in the pituitary, there could be an increase in what's called luteinizing hormone um, production, and that drives the ovary to increase um, and male type androgens, um, resulting in this syndrome. Another possibility is an insulin receptor defect. We're going to go over the typical characteristics of PCOS in a minute, and this will play a key role in terms of understanding why this could be a possible etiology as well. It's important to realize that in order to diagnose PCOS, many conferences have come together to try to put together a certain list of criteria. The most often used criteria is called the Rotterdam criteria. And in the Rotterdam criteria, you have to have two of the three following characteristics in the patient. She has to have ultrasound confirmed polycystic ovaries. And what that typically looks like is if you look at the ovary under ultrasound, it looks like an elliptical sphere, and all along the periphery you see these black circles which are the polycystic uh, markers um, for the syndrome. And this is often to re referred to as the string of pearl sign. A second uh, criteria would be increased androgens. Now you'll remember androgens, as I mentioned before, are male type hormones. But females often have, or excuse me, females do have male type hormones as well, but in the polycystic ovary syndrome they have increased uh, androgens. The third criteria that we look at would be oligo or amenorrhea. Oligomenorrhea is um, lack of consistent menstruations or, or not in regular menstrual cycles and typically it's less than eight in a 12 month time. Amenorrhea to, uh, means no menstrual cycle. And the reason for both of these in the PCOS um, syndrome is anovulation. The patient is um, just not ovulating an egg each month and therefore feeds back into oligo or amenorrhea. So what are the common symptoms that we see with PCOS? Remember that approximately 5% of the female population will have PCOS. So what do you look for in regard to symptoms? Well, as we mentioned before, there are increased androgens, but if you don't have lab values, you don't know that. So what you see in the patient um, with increased androgens is typically something called hirsutism. And hirsutism is male type hair growth or darkened terminal hair growth that women sometimes complain of on their upper lip or chin that they need to shave. Another common symptom that you see is obesity. Obesity affects about 50 to 60 percent of patients with PCOS which in turn leads to other symptoms as we'll discuss in a minute. A third characteristic that you see is something called insulin, sense, uh, re insulin resistance or frank diabetes. Um, this is a risk factor for diabetes um, in, in PCOS patients. Another very common symptom that we see, and we've already alluded to before, is the anovulation. 
and that leads to the irregular menstrual cycle. So usually women come in complaining of irregular cycles. That doctor, I don't have a menstrual cycle, but every 40 to 50 days, and when I do, it's heavy, heavy bleeding, and I've also noticed some hair growth on my upper lip and some weight gain. Because of all the above, you can have lipid problems, uh, which equals to the cholesterol issues that oftentimes is accompanied with PCOS. So why do we have this? Um, it's a vicious circle in terms of what's going on with PCOS uh, patients and what's driving their uh, hormones to do what they're doing. If you take a look at, say, the pituitary gland, and over here we say we have an ovary, again, with the string of pearl mark that we see on ultrasound. And over here is our liver. And lastly, the pancreas. What is going on in this environment is, like I mentioned, a very vicious cycle, or a vicious circle, or a vicious cycle, meaning, remember we talked about the possibility of increased LH. What that does, it feeds the ovary to make increased androgens. LH drives the ovarian production of androgens. Well, also in that regard, it also will increase the insulin production with the insulin resistance that you see in um, um, PCOS as well. Insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia will feed the liver and that causes something called SHBG to go down or sex hormone binding globulin. If insulin causes SHBG to go down, there's not as much of this binding globulin to bind to the androgens and that further increases the androgens. And all this also feeds back on the pituitary to increase this LH. The end result of all this is what we've talked about with the symptoms, but the main thing that we're also talking about with the ovaries and ovulation. And again, it's just a vicious circle that leads uh, from one to the other to the other and back around. So somewhere in this picture, you have to block it, and that's what we're gonna talk about in terms of treatment. So let's switch gears to talk about what you're gonna do when you see the patient in terms of the physical exam, and also, what sort of tests do you want to look for or draw in terms of blood tests? In terms of the physical exam, you're going to look at height and weight and of course get a BMI because as I mentioned before, about 50 to 60 percent of these folks are uh, obese. You're also going to look for hair growth. After you've gotten your complete history, if they mention it to you, you're going to see what they're talking about um, on your physical exam or you could also think of any problems with acne because both of these are associated with the increased androgen production that you see in PCOS. In terms of the tests, what you're going to do first and foremost, since they're coming in complaining of irregular cycles, and if they're in the reproductive age, you're going to order an HCG. You never forget the pregnancy test in most of these women. Um, another test that you're going to look at is in terms of ovarian function. You can get their estradiol level, their pituitary hormones that control their ovarian function, LH, which we mentioned before, and FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone. You can actually look at their ovarian reserve or how many follicles they have by getting something called AMH, which is anti mullerian hormone. And anti mullerian hormone actually comes from the cysts that you see on the ultrasound. Now, AMH is an excellent marker of PCOS, and typically an AMH of over 4.0 is indicative of PCOS. Other tests that you're going to consider would be insulin and glucose, you typically in a fasting nature, um, because as I mentioned before, there is um, insulin resistance. So the body is trying to increase your uh, glucose control by increasing your, uh, their insulin output and that's where you can pick up on some of this. Secondly, if you think frank diabetes is an issue, it would be wise to get a two-hour glucose tolerance test um, where they draw their insulin and glucose prior to and then after a sugar load. Um, and lastly, we talked about the lipids. You typically, if you're concerned with their lipid profile, uh, you want to look at their cholesterol um, profile because you want to decrease their cardiovascular risk that can be associated with all this. And one other thing I'll mention is we talked about the androgens. 
on that Rotterdam criteria, the two of the three that you have to have, that it goes without saying that you have to rule out other issues that could cause hyperandrogenemia or increased androgens. And those are typically done by looking for something called 17 hydroxyprogesterone, typically abbreviated 17 OHP. For those of you out there, this is ruling out congenital adrenal hyperplasia. You also want to look at um, um, testosterone. We talked about that. That's another androgen. And make sure that there's no, it, no indication to think that there is an ovarian tumor secreting testosterone. And typically, we're talking about elevated testosterone levels for a tumor over 200, which is very, very elevated. Usually, the PCOS folks have testosterone anywhere from 50 to 70 if they're hyperandrogenic. And the last thing you have to rule out, again, based on that Rotterdam criteria, would be something called Cushing syndrome or Cushing disease. Now, this is extremely rare. It's usually about a one in a million uh, diagnosis. So typically measuring cortisol, which is what's increased in Cushing's disease, is usually not done unless you have some physical characteristics uh, that you really are concerned with in terms of Cushing's disease. And I won't go into that as that's a whole other lecture. So in terms of treatment, what are we going to do for these women with PCOS? Well, I think you, if you break it down into two main categories, is it that they're wanting treatment for their menstrual cycles or are they wanting treatment for fertility? Because you have to remember if the bottom line of the PCOS is that they're not ovulating, well, if they're not ovulating, they're not going to get pregnant. So let's take the menstrual cycles first off. The very first line therapy is typically birth control pills. What this does is basically resets that vicious cycle that we talked about and gets the levels of both the androgens as well as the pituitary hormones in a situation that causes normal menstruation. If hirsutism or hair growth is a problem, you can add an androgen blocker um, to their regimen, typically called spironolactone. And this is an androgen receptor blocker, but it's also a weak diuretic as well. And then lastly, um, you have to think about, do they need diabetes medications? Do they need oral medications or even insulin injections if they're frank diabetics? Again, this is going to come in with your workup and the testing that we talked about earlier. In terms of fertility, Obviously, the goal is if they're not ovulating, you want them to ovulate because that's what releases the egg to allow them to become pregnant. And we have a number of uh, medicines for, um, for this. Typically, what we do is something called ovulation induction. And that is typically with oral medicines such as Clomid or Femera. And what these do is they trick the brain or the pituitary gland as we talked about before, into signaling your the over the patient's ovary with increased FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, because what that's going to do, hopefully, is get these follicles that are sitting at rest to mature and be, have a one dominant follicle in order to ovulate an egg. We have, like I mentioned before, we have a number of medicines that can do this. These are the bottom, or excuse me, the baseline uh, medicines that we typically use, but we do have injectable form um, FSH and LH to try to further uh, induce um, follicle maturation to help them ovulate. The last but possibly most important thing you have to think of in terms of your treatment, whether it be for her menstrual cycles or her fertility, is if when you read all the books, you will see that if you can have your patient lose 5 to 10 percent of their body weight, they could possibly restore normal menstrual cycles and ovulation in order to become fertile. So in conclusion, PCOS is a very broad category affecting a number of endocrine systems. The diagnosis is from that Rotterdam criteria after you have eliminated other causes of oligo or an ovulation or amenorrhea. Um, and you have to think about long-term consequences 
for the patient with PCOS. We've already talked about the lipids and how that can increase cardiovascular issues. One thing I didn't mention was as they are seeing this chronic anovulation, they are not having normal shedding of their endometrium. So you can have endometrial hyperplasia, which can lead to frank cancer. In some place, in some patients, so you have to consider doing an endometrial biopsy on these patients. Um, you have to remember, obesity is a very common issue with uh, PCOS, up to 50 to 60 percent of the time, and so you have to counsel your patients again on a five, at least a five to 10 percent weight loss if you can. And then lastly, pregnancy. A lot of patients with PCOS are going to have difficulty preg getting pregnant, and that's because they just don't have ovulation. And if you don't have ovulation, you don't release an egg, you can't get pregnant, and therefore you have to talk about ovulation induction medicines to get them to do to get there.